Good morning. This is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is July 31st, 2000. And this morning we are pleased to have with us Ray Movinci. Ray, uh, welcome. We're very happy to see you today. May I ask you how old you are? I'm 77 years old. And what is your current address? In Reading, Massachusetts. Reading, Mass. And your current marital status? Still married. <laughs> <clears throat> You're married to a very lovely lady. I happen to know her. <laughs> You're a lucky yeah, man. I know her too. <laughs> <laughs> do you have children, Ray? I do. I have uh, three girls and one boy. And <clears throat> grandchildren? Seven grandchildren. Seven grandchildren. And the oldest is? The oldest is what, uh, 18? And the youngest is? 10. 10. That's a good spread in there. Where were you born, Ray? I was born in Boston in the North End. And were you raised there? No, I was only there for about six months or so. And we moved to uh, Medford, Massachusetts. Tell us something about your family. Uh, what did your dad do? My father was a barber. And he had his uh, shop on 419 Hanover Street, <clears throat> which was next door to St. Stephen's Church. <clears throat> and um, my mother was a housewife, of course. <clears throat> we moved to Medford when I was around six months old, and I spent most of my life in Medford, Massachusetts. Did you go to the public <clears throat> schools there? Yep, I yeah. went right through all the schools in Medford. So you're a graduate of Medford High School? Yes. And what year did you get out of there? 1941. 1941. That was not a particularly good year to get out of school, I guess. No. Uh, you got out in June, was it, in 41? Yes. yes. And the following <clears throat> December, of course, was uh, Pearl Harbor. Right. Um, what was Medford like? At the Med, it, it's Medfield, isn't Medford. it? Medford. Medford. There's in, a difference. F -O -R -D. Yes. <clears throat> what was it like when you were there and growing up and it going into the high school? Well, moving from the north end of Boston to to Medford was like moving to the country. And when we first went there, it wasn't as built up as it is now. Uh, it was like people moving to the suburbs. Uh, very nice, uh, lots of nice people. <clears throat> I lived in South Medford, and uh, it was mostly Italians in that section. A lot of Italian stores, grocery stores, and so on. It's uh, about all I can tell you. And you were in the high school, you were 16, 17. Um, did the guys begin to talk about perhaps going into the service? Um, Germany of, and Europe, of course, were at war. The Japanese were spreading all over Asia. Did you guys talk about that possibility? Yeah, but I don't think that we were into it very deep. I don't think we really realized what was going on. And we were more interested in our personal lives, you know, sports, girls, etc. What did you do after you got out of high school? After I got out of high school, I um, what did I do? I worked for the for the railroad. I was a machine apprentice for the Boston and Maine Railroad up in Billerica, where we uh, <clears throat> repaired uh, engines. And uh, then I went into the service from there. Okay. Um, why did you go into the service? I was drafted. You were drafted. So uh, how old were you then? 20 years old. 20 years old. <clears throat> went into the service. Did you have any choice as to what uh, branch of service you would go into? No. No. So you were taken into the United States Army. That's right. Um, did friends and family join at the same time you did? Yeah, we had a little group that uh, went in together, probably about 20 of us, most of them from my neighborhood and others in Medford. 
and uh, we all marched up to the city hall where we got on a bus and uh, they took us to uh, uh, Fort Devens. Were these yeah. fellows you'd gone to high school with? Yeah. So you knew a lot of the guys as you were going into the service. Oh yeah. Went out to Fort <coughs> Devens and what happened to you there? Fort Devens? Well, it was interesting that uh, we uh, were all in the same barracks and sleeping in the same little area, two bunks and so on. And uh, I remember one interesting thing, my, one of my very closest friends uh, was a very, very particular type of person. And the first time we went to, we went to supper and they gave us the, the uh, mess kits. And uh, we went into supper and, and I remember very, very clearly that we had uh, beef stew. And as you might remember, John, when you went in the service, they just threw this stuff into the, into the mess kit with the beef stew. And we also had uh, um, uh, the mixed fruit there, cocktail fruit, you know, with all the mixed fruit. Well, everything was just mixed in together. <laughs> My friend wouldn't eat any of it. All he had was bread and butter. <laughs> and how long did that last that he ate just much. bread? No. Yeah. <clears throat> this was January of, of 1943, Ray, it is was, that correct? Yes, yeah. You're at Fort Devens and somebody's getting used to eating at a mess yeah, kit. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, was this where you were for basic training? No. Uh, where did you go for that? After we had all our interviews, uh, we were all separated. and. Uh, got on a train and headed west. <clears throat> An interesting development on, on the train. I think it must have been someplace out, outside of Chicago that my very close friend Ted um, was in another car or cars behind us. And the train had stopped at the, in, in the train station. And uh, he came down to visit me and we were talking and um, at that point, they separated the trains, the cars, <clears throat> and he should have been in the one that was going someplace else. And uh, I tried to get him to stay with me. I said, what's the difference? Stay with me and we'll go wherever we were going. <laughs> but no, he ran down the tracks, got on his train, and off he went. He ended up in Mississippi, and uh, I ended up in California. March Field, California. That's quite a difference, I would say. Yes. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> maybe he was right and maybe he was wrong in running right. after that train. <laughs> you went out to March Field in California. Had you ever been to California or no. west of the Mississippi no, before? No, I never had, no. And you're 20 years old and you're out on the West Coast yeah. now? Yeah. Um, why were you at March Field? I guess what they were doing is that they were assembling a brand new battalion and all of us that were on this train uh, came into March Field where they uh, were going to uh, put together this 854th Aviation Engineer Battalion and um, we uh, were stationed in the barracks and they had a cattery of older fellas, uh, older fellas they're probably 23 or 24, and uh, these fellows uh, had some experiences in, in uh, construction, and I guess they were going to be our mentors or tutors or whatever. When you were on this train, if we can back up a second here, and it split literally, and some guys went somewhere, Mississippi, and you went out to the coast, what caused that division? Had you taken tests at Fort Devens? Yeah, we had a whole lot of interviews. And at the interviews, they would ask us various questions about what we did and what was our background. Had we ever been in the service? Did you ever fire a rifle? And so on and so forth. And I suppose probably part of it based on that, that uh, they determined that uh, that we should be into some sort of manual labor or something. Well, you had done some kind of skill work for the railroad, yeah. and, and they looked at that, so you wound up in a construction battalion. That's right, yeah. Uh, tell us about that now. How big is a battalion? How many men? I think, if I'm not mistaken, there was probably about 800 men in, in this battalion. And tell us about what you learned there or what you were taught. 
Well, in the beginning, primarily we, we did more marching than any other type of, in other words, I don't think at Marchfield we did too much in the construction uh, learning. Uh, we, um, we did mostly marching and uh, I suppose that was to get us to understand about the military and uh, what you're supposed to do and so on. Rifle, shooting rifles and stuff like that. And uh, it wasn't until we moved out of Marchfield that uh, we got into the construction part of uh, learning. Okay, how much emphasis was put on <clears throat> your ability with a rifle? Did you think at this point uh, you, you might be uh, sent into the infantry? No. 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 No, I think it was fairly evident that uh, we, were, we were not going to be uh, using the rifles too much. So after you learned the basics of marching around and yeah. close order drill, <clears throat> uh, did you ship out then? What we did then is that uh, this was a very unique outfit. Um, we spent a lot of time in the desert in our training doing various construction jobs and whatnot and learning how to, some fellas were taught how to run heavy equipment, others uh, uh, got involved in repairs of uh, vehicles and equipment and so on and it was really a time for learning the things that we were going to do once we went overseas. What specifically did you <clears throat> learn or what were you taught there? Well, surprising part of it is uh, shortly wasn't too long well, I'd say maybe a couple of months after I was in the service, the next thing I knew I was a sergeant. And I don't know why, but <laughs> because we were, it was just a brand new outfit. They didn't really have any, other than the older fellas, any, uh, any uh, I don't know how to say it, uh, organization. This is the table of organization of a battalion required so many sergeants. That's right. Yeah. And they picked you, obviously, for reasons of merit. I really never knew why. And some of the guys in my outfit, whenever I meet up on our reunions, would always say the same thing. How did you ever become sergeant? <laughs> and I really don't know. <laughs> That's nice, though. You got a pay raise right, right off the bat. That's right. So what, what happened with us, we moved around a lot in between um, Southern California and various uh, places out in the desert and we even ended up doing some training in Arizona, Yuma, Arizona. That's hot. And uh, that's right. And we were training in the areas where uh, Patton's uh, army was, had, had been trained and it was very, very hot. And we did a lot of work out there. We, we learned how to <coughs> build airstrips. We learned how to put down this plank on plank, it's big strips that, uh, that you would hook together so that the airplanes could land on it because the, the ground wasn't uh, good for a plane landing or taking off. And it was really a, a quite a period of, uh, <clears throat> of learning the various aspects of, of construction. Some, some people learned carpentry, others learned uh, how to ha handle heavy equipment, bulldozers, uh, shovels and all that kind of stuff. Did you gravitate toward uh, construction of airfields specifically? That was going to be our, our basic mission. It was building airfields and, and whatever came with it. Uh, uh, we would build the airfields uh, and the hard stands where the planes would park. Uh, we would build things that, that had to go along with the airfields. We built barracks, we built Quonset huts for uh, personnel and other ways and so on and so forth. What about uh, water supplies? Um, did you guys get into that or were there other specialists who developed that? That wasn't part of that? our job, no. Okay. <clears throat> no. What did you like or dislike about the work that was assigned to you? I don't think I really disliked any of it. Uh, we're still in the United States, I take it, John, right? Yes. <clears throat> yeah. No, I don't think there was anything that I disliked about it. It was quite a learning experience for a 20-year-old kid to uh, get together with a bunch of guys from all over the country, uh, people you never met with before 
in particular Southerners. Uh, mm -hmm. They were entirely different from us who came from the North. In, in what ways, Ray? Well, education for one thing. A lot of these fellows uh, had difficulty reading. A lot of them had difficulty writing. And uh, <clears> then <throat> race factors sometimes came into it. Uh, if the cup, uh, the uh, thing came up about uh, colleges and so on and so forth, then they were vehemently on the opposite side of the northerners. So you had to learn to to learn to live with this kind of a thing. Then eventually, the uh, most of these guys became very, very good friends. Was yours a totally integrated uh, uh, unit? No, we didn't have blacks, no. Yeah, they, the army wasn't integrated Not up to this time, point. Not at that time, no. Funny part of it is that uh, in, in our being stationed and, and working in the, in the desert, we had a, an army post office number all the time we were in the United States, which is very unusual. And that's because we were moving so much. Or so remote that... Uh, yes, that's true. When right? you're in yeah. Yuma, there's not yeah. much around you. That's right, yeah. Would you rather have done something else if you had your druthers with... Did you wake up each morning and think, geez, I could be flying airplanes or doing something else? Not really. Were you pleased with the assignment uh, the Army had well, given actually, you? Well, actually, I thought I was pretty lucky. Uh, no one was shooting at me. So, you know, <laughs> that's pretty lucky. That's very well put. <laughs> and we were so busy. We, we worked, uh, when we finally went overseas and we were doing all the work, we would work around the clock. So that we really didn't have too much time to think about these things. <clears throat> Did the military, aside from teaching you a, 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 a profession, mm -hmm. uh, did they talk to you about cultural differences you might face if you were sent, say, to Europe or to the uh, South Pacific? I don't think we had much of that, John. Uh, on the island of Kwajalein, for instance, there were no natives there at all. They had just been, if they had been any, they were taken off, so we didn't, didn't have any interaction with natives there. On Guam, it was a different story. Okay. I'm looking to see if um, this was your, the point at your military career where you knew where you were going, or at least what you were going to do. Was there any insights in your organization as to whether you would go to Europe or to the South Pacific? Were you guys, were you guys told we're going out uh, west? I think the fact that we were in California, most people that went to the Pacific would ship out from California. <clears throat> so I don't think that we had any thoughts in our mind that we would be going to Europe. I'm pretty sure that uh, we knew we would be going someplace in the Pacific. Was the type of work you were doing transferable to any place except islands? Uh, I'm not sure that's a good question, but um, was the type of airfields you were going to work on, was that applicable to Europe or to uh, islands in the South Pacific? I suppose that uh, there were engineer battalions in Europe as well as <clears throat> United States, and I'm sure that, uh, that uh, they probably did similar work. Uh, there were CBs who did the same work that we did. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think perhaps maybe because where we were going uh, there was so much devastation and, and the need for construction battalions that maybe we weren't the same as Europe. Okay. How long were you out in the desert? Oh, I would guess probably seven or eight months. Which brings us up to uh, toward the end of 1943, is that correct? Yes. A, a, a very small question here, Ray. You're out in the desert working out there. Did anybody ever talk to you about the effects of sunlight on your skin? No, not at all. <clears throat> but I did have a problem. I had a problem with my eyes. Uh, my eyes would just um, close up when I went to bed at night and I'd get up in the morning. I'd have to pry them open because they were filled with mucus or mm -hmm. whatever. 
and they would give me drops for that. But <clears throat> other than that, uh, problems with skin in them, nobody even discussed that. No. no. We just turned brown, that's all. <laughs> well, you were, you were lucky you tanned. Yeah, that's right. right. <clears throat> okay, where did you go from there? Leaving the United States, you mean, John? Well, uh, <clears throat> you were out in California, New Mexico, or Arizona. Um, did you go back out to the coast? We went back to, uh, to Match Field. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and uh, I think what we did there was we, we regrouped, and uh, then they weeded out uh, various personnel that for some reason or another that they didn't think they wanted to take with them. So we got in a number of, of new people at that time in preparation for going overseas. Of the group of 20 or so that uh, from your high school, you all marched down to the city hall that day, half got left on a train that went to Mississippi. How many were still with you at this point? None. 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 Now you're alone. Yeah. And you're a sergeant. Yeah. <clears throat> and they're still wondering why you're a sergeant. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> Do your duty, at any time in your career, did your duties change significantly from what they were now at this point? No. Okay, so you guys are ready, pretty much ready as a unit to go overseas with some new faces among you. Where did these new guys come from? Were, were they as well trained as you? Some were, and some were specialist. I, I would guess that they must have realized that they must need some more experienced construction people, because a number of people who came in came in with certain skills. Had, <clears throat> had movies about the CBs and John Wayne and bulldozers come out at this time? Do you remember ever going to see a movie about the kind of work you were doing? No. I guess, I guess they came out later. Okay, can you tell us about uh, shipping overseas or getting ready to go? Yeah. I can remember that, uh, that we were given the word that we were shipping overseas, although they didn't tell us where we were going. <clears throat> and um, we um, got on a train and uh, headed for San Francisco, and we're coming from the Los Angeles area. And uh, funny thing happened on this train. My company was in in the front trains, Company A, and uh, we were going to have uh, lunch on the train. And uh, <clears throat> the cook uh, cooked. Um, um, chicken and the chicken was tainted <laughs> I didn't eat it anyway when are you going to get to the funny part <laughs> and uh, most of the guys get sick from yeah. this chicken it was one of the highlights and um, we went on to uh, Camp Stoneham in uh, just outside of San Francisco and we were isolated there for I think for three days or something like that and uh, then they took us to um, to the docks to ship out, and um, it was wasn't a very large ship. It was a, a former Dutch ship. I think it was called Coda a Going or something like that. And uh, we shipped out of Fort Mason, in the San Francisco. Did you have any opportunity um, before you got sealed up? to make any phone calls no. back home? No. So you're, you couldn't tell your family you were going right. overseas? Yeah, no. And did your ship carry all your bulldozers and every, all the other equipment? Some of it. Some came over on another ship. And uh, <clears throat> it was a 10-day trip from San Francisco to Hawaii on the island of Oahu. And uh, 
it was a very rough ship this, uh, uh, trip, and uh, eating was almost impossible. The ship just kept going up and down, up and down, and uh, I don't think we ate too much in that trip. Was your friend with the mess kit still with you? No. No, he's out in Mississippi. <laughs> what were your feelings? You left San Francisco, <clears throat> shipped out into the Pacific. Were you alone, part of a convoy? I guess that there must have been a convoy, John, but I'm not really sure. <clears throat> and what did you think? Ray Vincey, what, 21 now, maybe 21? Uh, up on the deck of a ship and heading into a, a war zone. Do, do you remember what you thought about at that time? No, I don't. It's too far back to remember. <clears throat> Did you guys sit around and talk about any uh, of the possibilities of where you were going? Oh, yeah. There was all kinds of speculation. But once we got beyond the Golden Gate, we were told uh, our destination. You were headed for a while, Pearl yeah. Harbor? What? Right. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, that was something to look forward to. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was very interesting in, in, in finally seeing land and seeing uh, Diamond Head. Uh, come up out of the out of the fog, so to speak, <clears throat> and uh, we landed on just uh, beyond Pearl Harbor, and they took us to uh, Schofield Barracks, and that that was the uh, the place that the uh, the movie was of. Which Tora, Tora, Tora. No, no, no. Um, from here to return it. Oh yeah, Burt Lancaster was stationed yeah. there. That's yeah, and right. this was a regular army base with all the the uh, uh, cement barracks and whatnot, so that uh, it was a permanent base. And um, that's where we uh, started doing some more training there. We had our Christmas there. And Christmas of '43. Yeah, uh, yeah, '43. Yeah. <clears throat> And we started assemble equipment and uh, do some some additional training and waiting for an assignment to wherever they were going to send us. When you say you did more training, did you go out onto the island of Oahu and uh, go to beaches or uh, what kind of training was this? Um, we did some work for for a couple of um, places uh, on, on the island. I forget where it was, but uh, in part of the training program, uh, I think we built some uh, revetments and things like that. And uh, uh, But there wasn't a, an intense training. Did a lot of marching. We marched through the uh, pineapple fields and stuff like that. Did you get leave to go into Honolulu? We did, yeah. We went into Honolulu. Tell us about wartime Honolulu. <clears throat> Well, Honolulu was a pretty busy place with, with lots and lots of service people, mostly Navy, and um, I wasn't really particularly over impressed with, uh, with uh, Honolulu to be honest with you, nor with Waikiki Beach. Uh, I think we have some better beaches here in Massachusetts to be honest with you, but uh, but it was good to get off off of base and just get in a town and uh, walk around. And how long were you on Oahu? I really don't know, but it's probably a month or so, maybe two at the, the longest. I, I guess I'm asking, uh, did you have any thought that you were going to get back on the same ship? No, I didn't. We didn't even think about that. OK. <clears throat> After a month, what happened? Then we were ready to ship out. And uh, they sent us to Kwajalein. I think we went in in Kwajalein maybe three or four days after D-Day or something like that. Okay, if you just stop a second, you're on the island of Oahu, and they call you out one morning and you're on the parade ground or whatever, and somebody gets up and says something to you and you know you're going into the combat zone. Can you remember that time? Vaguely. And what your feelings were about this? Like, this is it? Or whatever you might have reacted? I really don't know how I reacted, John. 
Uh, I suppose we were a little uh, uh, apprehensive about what was going to happen and so on and so forth. Uh, but I, I don't know that we had any great worries about it. I mean, figuring that we were a construction ba battalion rather than mm -hmm. a uh, uh, rifle platoon or something like mm -hmm. that. So you somehow got back down to Pearl Harbor and onto a ship? Mm -hmm. um, yes. Same ship? No. Okay. This was a bigger ship. Uh, I don't remember the name of it or anything like that, but this was a bigger ship. And when you sailed out, did you go with other ships? Yes, we, we joined a big convoy. Yeah. Tell us about a convoy leaving Pearl. Well, you really didn't see the ships, the other ships in the convoy. Uh, uh, I don't know how they worked this thing, but uh, we occasionally saw a, a battleship or something like that. But the other ships uh, were in the distance someplace. They, I don't think that we were too close to them. I can remember that uh, <clears throat> when, they, when they took us aboard ship and we had our duffel bags with us and so on, that we were taken down below decks and um, all of the sleeping, the bunks were one atop another, probably maybe five or six high. I, I don't remember the right amount, but uh, I remember getting the, the lowest bunk, which was on the deck, so to speak. The one everybody stood on to go up yeah. to the top. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, I think that this was the beginning of the first time that I never slept below decks. I always slept up on the deck. Took my blanket up there with a number of other guys <clears throat> and we'd find a spot. And that's where we'd sleep, right on the iron deck up above. It was pretty hot, I, I take it, and stuffy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, it was too close. Do you remember the name of the ship you were on, Ray? No, I don't. Okay, and at what point were you told where you were going? I would kind of guess that after we'd left uh, uh, Pearl Harbor. You were told the word Kwajalein? Yeah. Had you ever heard of Kwajalein Never. before? Never. Had you ever heard of the Marshall <coughs> Islands? No. Just some place that you were going to build an airstrip. That's right, yeah. Okay, and as you approach this, um, correct me, you knew there was an invasion force taking an island. You would follow to uh, build an airstrip. That's right. Did you know how close you were to uh, going ashore on D-Day? I don't believe so. I don't know that we were told that, uh, only that we would be going ashore. Maybe they didn't know themselves, you know, because how did we know how long it would take the Marines and Army to, uh, you know, yeah. clear the island. <clears throat> I did know that uh, our task was to get on the island as fast as possible and to build an airstrip as quickly as we could. You and I this morning <clears throat> looked at a map, um, and I'm very interested <clears throat> at where you were, what a historic area you were in, that north of you was Bikini, the island that was used for the atomic test. Just northwest of you was Wake Island that the Marines uh, held during, earlier in the war, and south of you was Tarawa, one of the worst invasions in the Pacific. When you guys moved into this area, did you have any idea what was around you? None whatsoever. Or where you were? No. Nope. Okay, tell us about seeing Kwajalein the first time. Well, when we looked off on the ship there, we could see this, this island with uh, uh, the palm trees that had been blown to smithereens. And, uh, and the beach it was littered with all kinds of debris and so on and so forth. And. Uh, I remember leaving the ship. We had to climb down these uh, rope cargo uh, nets, sort of like a net yeah. fair, which was very difficult uh, to uh, climb down, especially with your barracks bag and your rifle. But we got into the small boat and uh, they took us into the island. I would guess at this time that uh, that the island had been completely uh, taken over and. Uh, 
there was no, no real danger in our going up into the beach. The island <coughs> was secured? As far as I can remember. Was, but yeah. was there still fighting going on, or did you hear it? Probably might, might have been in one end of it. Yeah. But I don't think that there was uh, too much going on. What's the first thing you did when you went ashore? First thing we did was, uh, was um, they, they split us up by companies. There was a, a company A, B, and C, and headquarters. And uh, <clears throat> we, they took us to an area where we uh, put up our pup tents. A pup tent is each, each soldier had a half of a tent and uh, your buddy would have the other half. And um, it was just a, a small tent that just barely you could just crawl into and just covers you up uh, with just a tiny little thing, just enough to keep you out of the elements. And um, <clears throat> that's where we, we put up our, our little area there. Do you have a date for this when you went ashore, Ray? No, I don't. Okay, and other than in the book, John. Okay, and your unit when you went ashore. What unit were you? Oh, in? this is the eight hundred and eight five four aviation engineers. Okay, and your rank as a sergeant when you went ashore, they still let yeah. you keep your stripes. Yeah. What other units were nearby you? Do Do you know of any? Was there anybody else working on this airstrip with you? No. What was the weather like on Kwajalein when you landed? Beautiful there? weather. Beautiful weather. It, it was, it was hot, but uh, not so hot that you that it, it was overbearing or anything like that. It was it was good weather. Did the army give you uh, adequate clothing? When I say adequate, not the that you were warm enough, but did they send you a sure dress for the tropics? Yes. So yeah. that was a good deal for you. You oh, weren't yeah. in uh, something to take you to Antarctica or anything right. like no. that. Can you describe an island that has gone through the turmoil it had just before you got ashore? What does it look like? You, you mentioned shattered trees. Is, is, what was the rest of it like? This is a very small island. Yeah, yeah, it was very, very small. It, uh, uh, well, <clears throat> well, the trees were the one thing that stood out in my mind because uh, you could see where the bombs had just blasted them completely. There were just stumps there standing up. And uh, in the other areas, there was um, Japanese equipment that was blasted, trucks, uh, uh, tanks, uh, God knows what else, revetments, uh, all that kind of stuff that had just been blown to smithereen. And bodies, Japanese bodies, all over the place. Did your officers give you good leadership? Did you feel that uh, you were well commanded? Uh, you knew exactly what you were supposed to do? Well, you know, thinking back about the officers, <clears throat> you think as as a twenty year old that you, you you would well it's like looking up at a teacher. You look at the officers and you'd say, you know, you think that they're they're great and all that stuff. But when you think about it afterwards, you think that well, these were just young people. Also, <clears throat> I believe that most of these officers uh, were just out of college which would put him probably in the, uh, maybe at the oldest, 27 years old. Mm -hmm. And um, they were a nice bunch of guys. Uh, we didn't really get to know them too much because it was just work, work, work. That's all we did was we worked all the time. So you really didn't get to, to know anybody that well. Tell us about the work you did and the, was there a sense of urgency about this, we've got to get it done yesterday? Positively. positively. <clears throat> the putting, putting down the airstrip was the, the main thing that the, we were there to do. Uh, the Japanese had, had uh, started on a small strip. They hadn't done too much with it. Their, their equipment wasn't anything to brag about. 
whatever was left from after the bombardment. Uh, <clears throat> yes, it was very urgent to get the strip down. And uh, they broke down the various companies who were going to be doing different tasks on the strip. Um, some people were doing the heavy equipment. Others were, were doing uh, driving trucks. Some others uh, might be doing carpentry work and so on and so forth. We had a particular problem on Kwajalein. Uh, where it, it was an atoll, uh, there was no dirt there. This was just um, the uh, coral. And so they had a problem as to how they were going to build this strip. <clears throat> and uh, somebody came up with the idea of using the live coral, uh, which, which almost resembled cement. And we had these, these big drag line shovels that would throw the drag line out into the water, and they drag the caliche, they call it caliche, uh, of the coral up, and they dump it on trucks, and they take it out to the, the area we're building the airstrip, and it would be leveled off and, uh, and rolled and watered. They soon found that uh, <clears throat> this caliche dried up very fast. So we had, for 24 hours a, a, a day, uh, trucks with tanks on them with water going up and down the strip, keeping this place wet so they wouldn't dry out. And uh, we worked a 24-hour shift until we had the major jobs done. Some people were building barracks. Uh, some people were building uh, mess halls. Uh, others were, were uh, as I say, running the uh, heavy equipment bulldozers and so on and so forth. And what was I doing? I had, uh, I had uh, a crew of, uh, of a couple of big shovels and maybe half a dozen trucks or so, which uh, we kept filling up with this uh, uh, coral and stuff, which they would take to wherever, wherever they had to dump it and so on and so forth. Very interesting. Learned to drive a bulldozer. That was fun. Is that a skill you've ever used since? No. <laughs> okay, you get your airstrip done. Do you remember how long, how big an airstrip you were making? Uh, a th thousand feet, two thousand feet? I'm not sure, John. And <clears throat> did you stay, hang around long enough to see the planes come in? Oh, yeah. And what came yeah. <clears throat> in? Well, unfortunately, what came in the first time was a, uh, um, a Navy plane. I think they were bringing him in to test it. And somehow uh, uh, he dipped his wing down and broke off the wing and crashed. And uh, they had to uh, evacuate him. Uh, um, and after that, they tested some more. And I don't know whether it was his skill or whatever created this, but uh, they finally started bringing in the B-24s. They brought in quite a few of them. This is a four-engine bomber that uh, was from Kwajalein going forward up the chain, I, I imagine, yeah. to bomb other targets. That's Do you right. have any idea? Did yeah. you <clears throat> see bombing operations? Uh, All I saw was because our tents were, were within a short distance from the air, air uh, uh, field, and I used to see them taking off uh, night and day uh, to do their bombing. Do you have any idea where they were going? No, I don't. Were there any fighter planes, uh, smaller planes no. on the island? No, this was uh, just, just the B-24s. Just a bomber group. Okay. How long did you stay? Uh, what did you do then? Did you uh, feel your job was done and you were taken off the island or what? When they determined that uh, whatever we were doing uh, had been completed, I think another outfit came in to do other work there, and we shipped out and we went back to Hawaii. Okay, a, a question that I'm not even sure I can frame this, but did you guys learn anything there that you had never been taught that you had to, uh, making the caliche, for example? Uh, you, you hadn't been told about that out in the desert. No. Are there any examples of uh, American 
ingenuity oh. that you put into the test here. Yeah, quite a bit, yeah. Uh, I guess if, if you looked at the book I have there, you'll see that uh, um, they had to do a lot of ingenuity. They had to uh, improvise wherever possible because uh, you couldn't get supplies overnight. And sometimes trucks would break down. And I remember one particular thing is that the uh, the the lifts that would lift the uh, the uh, the bed of the truck up, uh, they were doing so much work with these that the the, uh, the lift part of it uh, would break the um, steel thing, and somehow or another our mechanics were able to improvise by by making another part for this, so as to keep the trucks going because we needed those tr trucks desperately. And various things like that that mm -hmm. uh, that our mechanics and whatnot would come up with. You I had to do that. Improvise positively. Yeah. <clears throat> I didn't ask you this before, but um, after the island was secured, you people were working there. Did the Japanese ever come back and bomb you, or no? Uh, that was the end of that. Yeah. No, they never did. They moved on out somewhere else. You're back in Oahu now, um, some R&R, &R, I would hope. Had a big party. Yeah. Because we, 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 while we were on the, on, the, on Kwajalein, uh, we were mostly having sea rations. Uh, sea rations are mostly these uh, cans, canned uh, food. You remember that, John, I'm sure. Or maybe you didn't. But um, sea rations is what we had, and, and uh, also, this stuff that comes in boxes, where it's a, a uh, supposedly a, a complete meal. You might get a, a little tin of cheese and a and a and a fruit bar, a uh, couple of cigarettes, a piece of toilet paper, and uh, what we used to call um, um, well, I can't even think of the name of it. But anyway, it was a powdery drink that you would put in with water and uh, uh, for your for your drink and whatnot. And when we got back to Oahu, we had tons and tons of fresh fruit and vegetables and all the best food that you can ask for. We had a big party. I don't blame you. It yeah. <laughs> sounds like you ate terribly for a while there. About what time is it, Ray? What's uh, the, in the middle of 44, something like that? Yeah, yeah. About the summer of 44. Somewhere around You're there. back in, in Oahu. Yeah. And how long did you stay there this time? Probably a couple of months. You were regrouping? Regrouping uh, and getting new people in where needed. Uh, getting new equipment, waiting for a reassignment. Did you follow the, uh, the progress of the war? Did you read Stars and Stripes or um, newspapers, the Honolulu Advertiser, I think it was, uh, to find out what was happening no, in the not, areas not out there? Not very much, uh, as far as personally is concerned. Uh, no, I don't think we did too much reading and stuff like that, John. I think we were, once we were back to the so-called mainland, uh, we were interested in having a good time. But you I, knew <laughs> you were also getting ready to go out and do it again. That's right, yeah. yeah. So how long, you, you say you were there a couple of months? A couple of months, You yeah. shipped out in, in the fall of 44, maybe? Somewhere around there, yeah, I don't remember the dates. Uh, you all packed up and got on another ship? Yeah. And when they announced where you were going, where was it this time? We were going to Guam. Yeah. And what was going on at Guam when you got there? Guam was um, um, different from Kwajalein. Kwajalein, there was no natives or anything like that. It was a tiny little island. <clears throat> Guam was a big place, and uh, and uh, it. Um, had big cities. Guam had big cities, and uh, because it was a major, major base. This is Agana, is it the, the yeah, capital? Of the Agana, yeah, Agana, yeah, right. And they had universities and and uh, fairly decent roads and stuff like that. We um, temporarily 
were, were bivouacked at, uh, on one side of the island where we did a little work on, on one of the fields. And uh, then they sent us up to the, <clears throat> the uh, northern part of, of the island where we were going to build a uh, uh, airstrip for B-29s. And I think they called it the North Field. And this was going to be a big field. Uh, again, they broke down our, the different companies in, into different tasks. For instance, Company B was uh, given the task, which I'm glad I wasn't in Company B, of um, <clears throat> uh, making up asphalt for the runways and for roads. And they had this big plant where uh, they would uh, put together all the ingredients, the stone and the and so on and so forth, and the tire and all that stuff, and uh, put that on, on trucks that, that had uh, uh, priority on the roads because they had to get to the airstrip that we were building as fast as possible. And uh, that was a, a hot, dirty job that they had. My uh, company <clears throat> uh, did a lot of um, carpentry work, uh, putting up Quonset huts and uh, stuff for uh, a, a hospital and nurses' quarters, uh, mess halls and stuff like near, that. Near this large field, North Field? Yeah. <clears throat> Did you stay there long enough to see the B-29s come in? Oh, yeah. yeah. Tell us about seeing B-29s. Yeah, that, was, that was awesome. The flying house. <clears throat> yeah. Awesome. Huge. Yeah. yeah. That was awesome. There's no doubt about it. Now, were you there when they were making their bombing runs too? Yes, they take we were. off for Japan. Yes, we I were. Take yeah. It, yeah. yeah. Tell, can you tell us about a little bit? Not about much, that? John, because we we weren't near the strip, and uh, we knew of them. Uh, we did see them. We saw them overhead and so on. But beyond that, I can't detail any other experiences with them. How long were you on Guam? Oh, I guess another six or seven months. This takes us up to our early 45, is that correct? I guess so, yeah. So we're headed toward Okinawa, aren't we? Yeah. Um, when you're, did your organization pack up and know they were going to go out again, yes. move? Yes, yeah. And you got on another ship? And you sailed out, and they, did they tell you where you were going? Yes. Yeah. Had you heard of Okinawa before? No. Never. Can you tell us uh, about approaching Okinawa? It's, this is a really big island now. It and is, And not yeah. far from the coast of Japan. <clears throat> yeah. Well, they held us up for, for quite a while because uh, uh, we just learned about this kamikaze thing that the Japanese were running. and. Uh, and apparently there were so many ships uh, that were sent to uh, Okinawa that <clears throat> the Japanese now had these suicide missions and they were bombing this fleet of ships and whatnot. Uh, we weren't that close to it, but we did hear about it and uh, it was kind of scary. And finally uh, we did land on Okinawa and um, approximately where it was very important where you landed uh, there depending you know the southern end was more fighting going on then where did you see uh, evidence of severe combat I saw the evidence but I didn't see any combat and did you land with the the unit you had been with previous to that so you were not among strangers? This was the same group that went through the other okay. two islands, yeah. All right, tell us about uh, what did Okinawa look like? Okinawa, again, was huge and uh, very heavily populated. Uh, lots of bombing, uh, lots of uh, blown up areas and heavily fortified, very heavily fortified. Um, we went in there again to build an airstrip and other things that go along with it, like buildings and so on and so forth. Um, 
At this point, uh, one of my duties, which was very interesting, was that uh, they gave me probably 25 or 30 or more Okinawans to uh, work for me, to do various tasks. And uh, that was kind of interesting because they didn't speak English and I didn't speak their language. But we managed through sign language and, and diagrams on the dirt and so on and so forth, so to tell them the things that we wanted them to do and so on and so forth. Uh, that was very interesting. Uh, <clears throat> one very interesting thing that happened in Okinawa is we were there during a typhoon, and that was very, very scary. We had been warned that it was coming and uh, didn't really know what to expect. It was quite bad, blue buildings and uh, materials and vehicles and ships all over the place. The Okinawans bury their dead in these uh, uh, grave sites that are built in the sides of, of the hills, and they're very, very ornate. And what they do is that uh, sometime after the, the, uh, the person has died, they um, clean off, after the bones, after the skin has rotted and so on and so forth, they clean off all the bones and they put them in these very fancy urns. And that's what goes in the, uh, into the uh, grave sites. And that's where we went during the typhoon <laughs> to get away from the winds and the, and the rains and everything else. How about people uh, in tents, um, in barracks, and in, in other uh, facilities? They all had to find some place to hide because uh, you couldn't stay in a barracks, you couldn't stay in a tent or anything that was uh, uh, that could be blown away. Now this was. Uh, can you tell us? Uh, Okinawa was was invaded on the first of April in '45 about when the typhoon came along following this? I don't remember, John. But was the war still going on? Oh, yes. Okay. Oh, yes. What and about the great fleet surrounding the island? What happened to that? Well, on the other side of the island, there was a like a natural bay. They call it Buckner Bay. And it's some famous admiral or general, I don't know what he was, but anyway, <clears throat> there was a number of uh, of um, ships, uh, uh, warships, and other types of ships there, and and a number of those were just blown right up on the beach. By did the, you did by you the see wind. this? I did. Yeah, it was really, really something to see these huge ships that are, uh, they're not like sailboats and whatnot. These are big ships blown right up on the on the land. Did this just shut down the war? For us, it did. The, the storm. I mean, does, <laughs> did everybody... Was, you couldn't do anything during this period. I don't care yeah. whether... <laughs> no one was shooting any guns or, or walking around or anything. This was just total chaos. You're a New Englander and have been up here through hurricane season. Have you ever seen anything like it since? No. <clears throat> no. That must have been quite an experience it in was, your life. Yeah. Um, the war ended. You were on Okinawa the, the night it ended? At this, this time I had a, a crew that we were, what we were doing was I worked, I had a night crew and uh, we were drilling, uh, we had these big drills that we were drilling uh, holes in the, in the rock so that they could blast it and use it for construction. So I had a night crew, and we were drilling these holes, and and uh, so that they could do the blasting the next day. <clears throat> and um, while we were working there, all of a sudden we see the traces all over the sky, and uh, it almost appears. I said, thought maybe are we being invaded because they were shooting their uh, machine guns and everything up in the sky, and. Uh, when we go back to camp, we found out that the war was over and everybody had been celebrating because we didn't know anything about it. We could continue working out there. While you were working or, or prior to that night, uh, were you subject to raids, uh, uh, 
being no. fired at, bombed, no. or anything like that? not at all, no. <clears throat> and you saw the great celebration on Okinawa that night, which was pretty deadly to some of the guys who uh, were under all that lead coming down. The war is over. How old do you now, Ray? 22, 23 years old? Was it 20, 20, 22 years old? Yeah, because I would have been 23 in January. Yeah, 22. Can you think back half a century or more? Uh, what did you think about? The war is over. Um, maybe I'm going home when I get enough points. What happened at that point, and <clears throat> a lot of the, the guys in that outfit, the older fellas that had enough points, all of a sudden left us. And little by little, little groups, you never saw them again, they were gone. And uh, we were just waiting around for, for them to determine what to do with, with the rest of us. So we didn't have any, any particular duties at the time. And uh, oh yeah, they started thinking about home, of course, yeah. Yeah. Was there a m most memorable experience in your whole career in the Army? Something that stands out more than anything else? Yeah, there was one time <clears throat> when we were, <coughs> excuse me, when we were back in the States and we were in that training period, the captain of, of Company A, which was my company, somehow decided that uh, they were going to take us on a forced march. And we were out in Needles, California, which is out in the desert. It's right on the border. Yep. Yeah. And um, it was full pack, rifles, canteen full of water, and so on and so forth. And uh, it was going to be a 25 mile march. We were going to go to Camp Young, which was about 25 miles away from us. And <clears throat> yes, this I'll never forget this because this was really, really something. It was very, very hot. And we were in f full gear and so on. And uh, we were supposed to meet the uh, cook truck somewhere along the line of our match and uh, with water and so on and so forth. <clears throat> and little by little as we went along, the fellows would be dropping out because they just couldn't take it. It was too much for them. The heat, the weight of the equipment that they were carrying and whatnot, it was really something. Unfortunately, the, the, the cook and his trucks took another route, and they never were where we were supposed to meet them. They were lost someplace. So we continued marching. Most of the guys had run out of water, and uh, you could see them with, the, with their mouths were, were gray and, and uh, parched and so on and so forth. It was really, really quite bad. But they, we kept marching, and, and as I say, quite a number of them dropped out. And uh, very guys with very little water. And um, we finally got to a point where someone was able to tell somebody at Camp Young that, that we needed help. And they came back with uh, these five gallon cans of water. <clears throat> and uh, to see the guys rushing for the water, it was almost like you were out in the desert. and. Uh, and you had been out of water for days, you know, and that you were just dying of thirst. It was really, really something. And uh, I'll never, never forget that. It was quite an experience. My next question is about a most memorable character, other than that officer who led you on that walk. But uh, in the years you were in the Army, is there some person that you think about as uh, outstanding? No, other than my fellow uh, guys in my outfit. No, I don't, I don't remember any particular ones that uh, I know of a few that I didn't like, but I don't want to go into that. 
<laughs> I know uh, that your outfit holds reunions, Ray. Yes, we do. Uh, yeah. I think once a year you go yes, we places. Do. Yeah, we have, we have a reunion um, every uh, October. And it's really nice to see these guys. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of them are unable to show up at the next one because either they've passed along or they just couldn't, because of uh, various illnesses, couldn't make it or whatnot. But those that do show up, it's, it's quite a thing. Can I ask you what you talk about? Well, sometimes one of the guys will say to me, how did you ever make Sergeant? <laughs> They're still at it. <laughs> and, uh, oh, you rehash things, you know, you talk about the, some things that happened, who did this, who did that, uh, do you remember the Christmas party we had before we left uh, 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 Hawaii and so on and so forth, uh, uh, who's sick, who's not coming to the meetings and so on, will we be there the next year, and all that kind of stuff. Usually, what's happened in the last few years is that um, probably we may have 25 guys showing up, and the rest will be widows, wives, uh, children, so on and so forth. What happens is that they, that they usually have these meetings in one of the cities where one of the veterans came, comes from and he would set up the meeting. Yeah, very good. Do you know uh, if any of them have ever gone back to Kwajalein? Have you ever gone back to that area of the world? No, but Kwajalein, the way I understand it, is, is uh, off limits. Uh, it's, no a, one, it's a missile site now, Yeah, right, yeah. yeah. But as far as I know, uh, other than people going back to Hawaii, no one has ever gone beyond that. I'd like to someday, but... Yeah. Uh, when and where were you discharged? We got on the boat in Okinawa and we headed home. I remember going up the Columbia River and we disembarked and they took us over to uh, Vancouver Barracks, which I believe is in Portland, Oregon area. I'm not really sure where it is. I think it's Portland outside of Portland. And uh, that's where we got all kinds of new uniforms and discarded all our stuff that we brought back with us. Everybody made a beeline for the telephone to call home to tell us what we were doing and where we were going. And we were there for maybe three or four days, I don't recall how many. Put us on a train and headed back to Fort Devens, where it all started. And that's where they kissed you goodbye, and, and uh, not to bring up the subject again, but what rank were you at that time? I was still a sergeant, yeah. <clears throat> and with what decorations, Ray? Oh, I don't recall, John. We, I, don't, I don't have any decorations for valor. We got a lot of decorations for, for the work we did and, the, and the, the way we did it and so Citations. on and so forth. And we got, citations for being in the Pacific and citations for being a number of years and all that kind of stuff, but I don't recall. Okay. Did you join a, a reserve unit of, of any kind after you got home? During our interviews uh, at Fort Devens, they asked us a lot of questions, what we'd like to do and, and uh, uh, different things they would want you to join. All I wanted to do was go home I didn't join anything. I didn't sign anything. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing I did do. Is this on the record? Yes, sir. Um, I went AWOL. You're not the first one that said that in this room. So really? Go right it, ahead. Well, what happened was that I called home and told them where I was. And uh, I knew we were going to have a, a free day. So I said, the heck with it. I'm going home. So I got on a on a bus, went out the gate, went out to the train, took a train to Cambridge and got a cab and uh, took a cab to Medford, Mass. Spent the night with my family, 
the next day I got back on the train, I went back to Fort Devens, got on the bus to take me back into the camp and I was scared, you know, to death. And on the bus came the MPs, going up and down the line, checking the your passes. I'm saying, what's gonna happen to me? And he only went halfway down and uh, didn't ask me for a pass or anything, and he went back out the door. Sigh of relief. Right, I thought for have... sure after three years in the service I'd be put in the brig. Well, they'd take your sergeant stripes away from you. <laughs> My buddy that went to Mississippi what came, happened in, to him? came in the day after I came in. Did he really? Imagine that. So almost three years from the time we left Fort Devens, the three years that uh, we were in the service, we both came home almost the same time. But did he have any good stories to tell? No, only that he ate in PXs all the time. <laughs> and he too came out as a sergeant. Did they ask him why? I don't think so. No. <laughs> Did you join any veterans organizations such as the American Legion? Yes, the I did. I did. Uh, um, um, primarily, I joined the American Legion because they wanted to establish a basketball play team, and that was my game. And uh, so a bunch of us in Medford, uh, uh, who were basketball players, joined the American Legion primarily to play basketball, but uh, I didn't stay there too long. I did. I really didn't care for the type of an organization. This is a, almost a vague question, Ray, but what were your feelings about coming home? You had, before you were 25 years old, you'd given almost oh, more than three years of your life to the United States military service. You're coming home. What kind of reception did you get? My brother came up to pick me up with a whole bunch of my friends, drove home. Naturally, the family was excited that I was home. My older brother, had, uh, who had uh, quite a time on the Guadalcanal and Bougainville and whatnot, already was home. And uh, it was quite a big reunion, had a big party, and got back in a normal life. When you came home, did you discuss with you, you're not married yet, but you, did you discuss with your family or friends what you had seen and what you had done? Yeah, a little bit, but I don't think that we dwelled on it too much. Did they ask you about it? My parents, not really. I told them a few things, uh, but other than that, I don't know that they could really understand what it was all about and what we did and so on and so forth. I think they were just as happy that my brother and I came back. How important to you was serving in the military? I think it was very important. I don't know if I would have enlisted on my own, but once I was in there, I realized that, uh, that it was something that I had to do. Uh, I, I wouldn't change it for the world. I, I think it was such a, a wonderful experience. Uh, it was, but maybe because I wasn't being shot at. You know, I think if, if some of the stories I got from some of my friends who were in Europe and whatnot, and, uh, saw their friends dying alongside of them and so on and so forth, maybe I would have thought a little differently. What did you think then and, and what, did, what do you think now about the war you were involved in? Well, I, I don't think that there was anything else we could do, really. <clears throat> uh, we, we had to do what we did. Uh, uh, after Pearl Harbor, I don't think that we had any, any other recourse, uh, and I still think that way. You had certain ideas about the war and why you were going into the war um, at the beginning. 
Is there any point during your service where you found you had a change of heart about the war or the American objectives, what no. it was doing? No. That never changed? No. Do you feel there was any difference in public opinion regarding the uh, veterans who served in your war um, and those who were in Korea or Vietnam? Entirely different. Two different, two different kind of wars, two different types of reasonings. Entirely different, yeah. Have you ever received any veterans' benefits uh, or taken advantage of um, hospitalization or anything like that, or insurance or no. any programs like that? No, even the insurances, when they were interviewing us at uh, Fort Devens, I just, as I told you before, <laughs> you just wanted to get out. All I wanted was out. I didn't yeah. want, want any anything. Above all that we've done here this morning, Ray, is there one thought or incident or one last um, idea you would like to share with your family or people who will see this tape? No, I don't think so. Is there anything we haven't asked you that you would like to uh, No, I think you did a very here? good job, John. Thank you, Ray. And the lights are hot. <laughs> Ray, thank you very much for coming in today. My pleasure. <laughs> are you still a sergeant? <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs>